space is a very challenging environment for life. It's full of radiation. This can be extremely cold environments, extremely hot environments, environments where you have rapid freeze-thaw cycles, which tends to be really bad for life. So if you want to have a sustained long-term human presence in space, it's very likely that you're also going to need to figure out how to get microbes to be able to grow in space. So human beings, although we don't think of it very often, we really depend on microbial life. We have it all over our skin, we have it in our mouths, we have it in our stomachs, we have it in our intestines. They clean our air, they clean our water, they help recycle our waste, they can provide our food. And if you can take life with you to wherever you're going, and you can grow what you need to support human beings, as opposed to just shipping it all FedEx off to Mars, that makes Mars much more likely a place where human beings are going to go. I ended up getting interested in this pretty wacky idea that a lot of Mars people talk about called terraforming, which is the idea of taking the Martian environment, or any environment, and making it more like Earth's. Mike is kind of the archetype of the big vision space geek. You know, he wants to see human beings settle the entire solar system. He wants to terraform every planet that can be terraformed. And we were having discussions about terraforming. And he said, well, I think all you really need to do is start by making something that can survive on the surface of Mars. So the idea was build a little machine that has a Martian environment in it. And he said, well, but if you just put your organisms in a Mars simulation chamber and you just kept turning up the Mars dial, wouldn't eventually you have to get something that would survive on the surface of Mars? And I said, that's not hard. Let's try it. So the project is called Dynamic Control of Directed Evolution. And um, it is basically a black box approach to studying the dynamics of life in its environment. We run through multiple iterations of taking E. coli and exposing them to UVC radiation. Um, this will kill most of them and it scrambles the genomes, it mutates the rest. And then we let, them, we let the survivors regrow and then we do this repeatedly. And we go through multiple iterations of this and we watch how the properties of the population of E. coli change through these cycles. And this is really a classic engineering problem. You have a system, say a population of microbes in an environment you don't know anything at all about their internal workings. In fact, you don't want to have to know anything at all about their internal workings. You just want to measure the parameters that you're interested in, and you want to control the environmental factors that you're interested in. You want to build a map of how those two things relate to each other, and then you want to use that map to push your system towards a particular state. And we did it for seven iterations and we saw approximately a six order of magnitude increase in the survival ratio of the E. coli, which was fabulous. That's on par with the biggest change that's ever been reported. It is an extremely labor intensive process to try to do this by hand. And you're going to make mistakes. Um, this is not a matter of just throwing more grad students at the problem and yelling at them when they screw up. You have a scalability problem there. It turns out it's really, really hard to manipulate life. It's just this huge, messy, sloppy system that happens to do these incredibly complex things. So we knew we had to automate it just to be able to get the data out. So this is the machine that actually automates uh, the complex hand biology experiments that we've been performing. These daughter boards each control one subsystem. So this one here controls the agitation, this one controls pumps, this one here is temperature, and this one is sensor readings. And then inside the box, we also have our peristaltic pump, which pumps fluid in, and we have our power supply over here. So we grow our organisms. Um, we have attached a bunch of different sensors to them so that we can monitor how well they're doing. So what the current population is, how fast they're reproducing. Inside here is where we grow our cells. One side, we have lights, and this side, we have sensors. So the big advantage to this system is that it is autonomous. Uh, you put your cell culture in there and then you just let it run. And the process that you use to build a dynamically adjusted model of how those outputs are affected by those inputs, 
that's, in some senses, that's the heart of machine learning. And so not only are we doing really interesting multidisciplinary work, we're producing people who have really needed cross-disciplinary skills. That's the next stage of the project. That's where we want to take it. And I'm very excited about that because if we can crack that problem, then we've really created a new kind of bioengineering tool. Without the ability to take life with us, we're never gonna go. Life is our support system. Everything that keeps you and me alive is alive. And if we can't get it to go with us, we're, we're never gonna make it. It's gonna be too expensive. So directed evolution is gonna be really important in order to harness life for uses here on Earth. I also think that it's necessary, if we're going to go to space, that we be able to do that, that we be able to control life, that we be able to use it in those applications that are going to keep human beings alive and keep our civilization ticking.